Welcome. Good morning to our friends in Hawaii. And good afternoon and evening to our friends elsewhere. Thanks so much for joining us at Think Tech Hawaii. And we have the great fortune to have with us today, starting with ladies first and preeminence as deserved. Professor Emerita Fernelia Randall from the University of Dayton School of Law and one of the leading national and international experts and an incredibly comprehensive compiler of works on race, racism, and the law. Internationally respected for that. And this year's Society of American Law Teachers Award winner for the Great Teacher Award, which is for those who are active in legal education, a very major lifetime achievement award. Congratulations and thanks for Hussey Randall for joining us. Thank you. Ben Davis, formerly professor, well, professor emeritus from the University of Toledo School of Law, then University of Illinois at Chicago School of Law, now at Washington Lee School of Law. <laughs> and previous to that, an international scholar, lawyer, and a legal role model in Europe internationally, as well as in the US nationally, former chair of the American Bar Association's dispute resolution section, and current chair, David Larson, also joining us, <laughs> a seasoned professor at the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in the Twin Cities in St. Paul, <laughs> and the leader and innovator of bringing access to justice through online dispute resolution to the courts of New York, a project that was years in the works and years in its progress and culmination. Thank you all for joining us. So one thing that's become visible, I think, to all of us is for the last few years, we in the US have been focused intensely and intently on domestic assaults on institutions, principles, practices, and leaders of democracy. And in the last few weeks, that focus has shifted to, to the international arena with Russia's attacks, unprovoked attacks on Ukraine. And where that's headed. So what we're not seeing in the media and what might be worth exploring a little bit today is, is there a connection between those national and international assaults on democracy and the values, principles and practices to build and rebuild democracy? Mm -hmm. Professor Randall? I thought David was getting ready to say something. What were you going to say? There you go. Okay, David. That, yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I absolutely think there's a connection. I think that um, what's happening in Ukraine is uh, is inspiring us and shaming us. Um, I think it's really making us think about the value and importance of democracy in maybe ways we haven't recently, referring to what Chuck was saying about kind of our inward looking domestic focus. And as we're doing all the domestic focus, I don't think we've put enough value on democracy as opposed to autocratism and, um, and despotism. And, uh, and I think what's happening in Ukraine is, is, is kind of shocking us and shaming us to, to realizing that maybe we haven't put enough value on democracy and inclusion and the right to vote for everybody and how important that is. Um, so, uh, and the way that what's happening in Ukraine is is kind of activating the democratic world and in ways that we weren't sure would happen again. Um, you've got Germany leaving its policy of non-intervention um, and now sending arms to Ukraine. You've got Sweden, which stayed neutral under Hitler, now sending arms to Ukraine. And the, dem the democracies around the world are finally recognizing the threat of these autocratic governments. Uh, and I think it's incredibly important. 
Yeah, Mr. Um, or Ben, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Well, um, well, what what I was going to say was, uh, I woke up yesterday morning and uh, I was thinking I needed to buy a plane ticket to Kiev to go take up arms with with the uh, Ukrainians with regards to what was going on there. And then my body woke up and said, Ben, 66 year old guy, there's about a blow, about to blow a breath at you and you'd fall over in a second, you know, and me running around, wait a minute, I got to take my pills and I'll be right with you with that gun. You know, I, I had, you know, I, re, I, re, I had this sort of uh, Lincoln Brigade in the Spanish Civil War, George Orwell, homage to Catalonia fantasy for about 20 minutes. But I did listen to a, I don't know who she was in uh, Ukraine who was saying that, you know, here, sort of for 30 years, we've been trying to be a democracy here in Ukraine. And right now is like our moment, okay, where they're basically trying to be a democracy, kind of like the Europeans' democracies, kind of looking towards Europe. And uh, the question in their moment now is whether, in fact, they will be able to do that, or is it going to be going sort of back to the classic sort of puppet regime uh, situation uh, in the Soviet era. Um, one of the, and, and the ways that she put it in sort of a very simple kind of a, uh, manner of that this is the moment for the Ukrainians, you know, to see what that decision is going to be and, and who's going to help them uh, try to, to be uh, that, that, that democracy. Um, and uh, that really struck me uh, as to putting us all sort of in front of sort of their reality that they said, we're, you know, they're going to fight. They're going to fight. They're going to do the best they can, you know. But, uh, the, you know, that, that, that was sort of a way of framing the stakes that I found really uh, quite uh, uh, perceptive, if I could say it like that. Uh, the other thing is... Uh, the change in the last week of the approach of sanctions that we've seen that's come out is quite amazing in, in terms of getting all of uh, the 27 European or 28 European countries together, uh, along with the United States, the kind of sanctions that have been put forward, the addressing the uh, really kind of separating out the central bank, the Russian central bank and the banking system, the SWIFT system, which is kind of like, you know, the, the gold star space for international finance, all of those, even the Swiss, you know, I mean, those things I, uh, are unprecedented. And uh, they, they are uh, about as strong a response as I could ever imagine would be done to something like this, other than troops being sent in. I mean, there's weaponry being sent in to, to help the Ukrainians. I'm certain that the intelligence community is providing uh, information. I don't know, but I, I, to, to the Ukrainians. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things being done to, uh, to uh, support this Ukrainian effort short of troops going in. But there's a part of me that has this real wondering feeling uh, about if that is where the battle for democracy is going on right now, um, are we really doing enough? Because there seem to be a number of people inside the United States and in other places in the world who seem to love the idea of the autocratic leader. The one sort of Papa will take care of or Mama will take care of everything. And, you know, as long as I kiss up to them, they will give me things and all that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I find it uh, quite honestly shameful to see that people haven't at least learned how awful that can be in the in uh, with whatever all the history that 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 has happened. But then again, of course, there's a lot of ignorance, right? There's a lot of ignorance, uh, purposely whatever. But there's just a lot of ignorance. And, and I'm not going to say here, please, that I you know think the Ukrainians are the greatest thing since Swiss cheese. You know, I've heard of some bad things that have happened along the borders with refugees, like. Uh, some of the African students hitting on, having some some difficult moments along the way. You know, those are 
refugee situations are always awful. They're always some. Well, let's not play down what the Ukrainians are doing to Africans. They're doing more than giving them a difficult way. They're discriminating based on color of skin, letting white refugees, white Ukrainians go first and pushing back black refugees uh, when whites come up to the end of the line. Don't get me wrong. I, I would like to say I'm Switzerland in this, but it doesn't look like Switzerland is even being neutral. No. Nope. Uh, the, the issue for me, the problem for me is, yeah, Russia is autocratic and we don't need autocratic, but we don't have a democracy and haven't had one in, and I don't know how many years. We, we kind of cover our idea of democracy because we have a one party system, capitalist, and both Democrats and Republicans have made sure that no socialist party can get a foothold in this country country. So in my mind, that's not a democracy. A democracy would say, if there's enough people in a country who supports a particular political view, we are going to make sure that they are represented in the halls of law, in the halls of government. But we do exactly the opposite. Uh, and so I, I don't know. I feel like uh, I don't want an autocratic govern, uh, government, but I don't believe we have a democracy either. So uh, it's hard for me to say, uh, how do we shore up our democracy when we don't really have a democracy? And going back to your point, Ben, the, the reports about what has been happening, what's interesting is two things racially is going on in that whole scenario. First, the whole treating different at the border different based on the color of their skin. Secondly, is once those videos start came out, Russia, some people started posting videos of Russians confronting black people and handing them bananas. I do not even know what that's about. It didn't, it, 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 I guess the implication is Russians are racist too, which we already knew. But, um, yeah, I, I will go but with I that think we a... don't need to, in our support for Ukraine, we don't need to downplay the racialized behavior that they're going, the anti-Black behavior that they're engaged in, and what that means for their democracy when, if they win against Russia. I think it's a, it's a, it's a not only is it, is it an opportune time for us to reevaluate our, our strength and backing of the concept of democracy, but also to re-examine how we're living it. Um, I think we can do those two things to say that um, it's the time now to draw that line between uh, autocratic leaders and democracies. And while we're doing that, let's see how well we're doing with democracy. Um, and uh, it can be a time where not only we express strongly our support for democracy, but also re-examine it and, and ask whether or not we can do it better. And I, and I mentioned a little bit earlier the idea of being more inclusive in terms of protecting the vote. I think that's a, that's a fundamental thing that we can be doing better. And then we could certainly increase um, our, our, our allegiance and, and, and pledge to democracy by doing that. And I, I'm still hoping that we can get okay. some legislation in the United States um, uh, to reinstate some of those voting rights that are getting eviscerated mm -hmm. at the state level. So I, I would just like to say that uh, having lived for 17 years in Europe as an immigrant, okay, um, and seeing the political games being played with regards to immigrants over there and immigrants here, I think it's important uh, that th that also be part of the frame of how we look at what's going on there, because uh, there is both the color aspect and the immigrant aspect or foreigner aspect that is operating. And we've seen that also here in, in, in our country. Uh, Lord knows the various laws that were passed like the Chinese Exclusion Act and things like that back in the day. So, you know, I think that, you know, 
those 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 points are important. Um, I, you know, and maybe I'm just reacting emotionally. And if I am, I apologize. But when I listen to that lady talking about what they're trying to do in Ukraine and what the battle is for them as Ukrainians there, and maybe it's a little biased because I was visited there back in 1970 when I was a kid. I actually was uh, saw it was in Kiev and, and all that, and, you know, and had my head uh, surprised to realize that uh, these people in the Soviet space did not have horns, you know, and, you know, did not, uh, I don't know, look different and have clef cleft foot uh, based on the propaganda I'd heard as an American, you know. Um, um, I'm also kind of moved by at least a video or movie I saw about Chernobyl you know, that they had to deal with and how they had to uh, confront that with ordinary people basically taking enormous risks because they didn't have the technology to really address the radiation that they had. And they did it, you know. Um, there's a, a part of me that just has got a kind of uh, uh, a sense that uh, something really wrong has happened to these people that uh, we have to confront. Uh, and, uh, and how to confront it, I understand, is a very complicated thing, but um, I'm encouraged by the amount of confrontation that's been willing to be done so far. I'm dismayed by who stands on the sidelines. I look, I look to China and say, so where are you at, China, in this thing? Is this like you're looking so that you can do something towards Taiwan soon or something? I mean, you know, What's the game that the, the autocratic folks want to play? As to democracy in the United States, you know, I agree. There's a lot of things that are fundamentally wrong and have been wrong for a long time. I love to look at the uh, 1901 speech of the last uh, black representative from the South, farewell the Negro to Congress, talking about all the shenanigans he had to deal with in 1901, right? Uh, when he lost his seat. Um, at the same time, I'm like, I just kind of have a feeling like, no, this is some time that whatever the ideals that we espouse and want to have happen and fight for um, domestically and uh, internationally, they, 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 they have valence. So we, may, we, we have to try to show to people that they have valence without, uh, you know, without diminishing the complexities that are there. I don't know what the answer is. You know, I, I know that if you're in Russia, you can have some rough time being a black person too. I know if you're in China, you can have some tough time being a black person too. I know in America, you can have a tough time being a black person too. I'm not diminishing any of it. I'm just saying that there's some kind of things that are like principles um, that, uh, we but my principle is, is I do not want to send my grandkids off to war to fight for any country, the United States of America, Ukraine, or Russia, who's engaged in significant anti-Black racism. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, this is how strongly to back to my son was very young. I think he was maybe during the Vietnam War era. Uh, I became a Quaker only so I could make sure, because the war wasn't over, make sure that my son could uh, claim uh, a, a, a status of not fighting. But I mean, it. you know, when I'm on these lists with people with other black people and that we're talking about what you know if this was to go to war the people who are going to be going and dying in the war representing the united states are going to be disproportionately people of color black brown native american and latino people uh and and waving a banner of democracy that they don't have and so it's it's hard for me to justify to them why we should get involved at all. You know? Well, well, I mean, I can I can see that 
I mean, uh, yeah, I see that argument. To me, why get involved at all? You know, it's like you can look at you can look at any war that the United States has been in, going back to at least the Civil War or certainly the Revolutionary War, and uh, you have seen that there were black troops who fought and who suffered even in the most virulently racist militaries that they had to deal with, that they fought for some kind of an ideal that they thought was important. Now, you can say when they came home, they were lynched, they had horrendous things happen to them. Yet at each point along the way, when it came to the crunch, and I'm, I'm talking up to at least through World War II um, and uh, in the Korean War, um, they fought. And people like Thurgood Marshall used to go out there and criticize the structure of the military and how these people were treated unequally inside the military and uh, in the current levels of court martial and things like that to try to uh, uh, get some kind of equality operated with regards to what they were dealing with, you know? But, but they, you know, they, they did fight those battles. And part of the battle was a theory, I guess, which was that if we fight fascism here, it'll help us with fighting fascism at home. And, you know, the which question- didn't work was, out that way. It didn't work, at, well, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> It, it worked out some ways, but it didn't work out all the ways, okay? I mean, there are things that didn't go and the things that did go. It's like the morphing that's been going on for 400 years, right? But my, my, my personal thing, and again, it's just a personal thing for me, is uh, um, in this particular war, first thing I always start with is, I think he's Greek, he may be Roman, or you always can correct me, a guy named Aeschylus said the, the first casualty of war is truth. Right, so it's really hard to know what the truth is that's going on there. But to me, it's kind of like this is an attempt by some people to have some kind of democracy. And clearly there's an autocratic party that is trying to repress them, that is using the words of genocide uh, in ways that I find really instrumentalized, that are using the words of, uh, of uh, being in by consent of countries that they have magically recognized in, the, in two minutes and all. I mean, it's a lot of like manipulative things that are going on, at least to me, that uh, I find uh, is basically a, a, a vision of might makes right. And we have our contradictions. You know, I noticed that, by the way, on the vote in the resolution on the General Assembly, Iraq abstained. <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. They didn't vote for it. They didn't vote against it. They just abstained. And I thought that was a really interesting one, given what we did in Iraq. You know what I mean? Uh, and what the UK did in Iraq. I just said, ah, that's interesting. Uh, but uh, what I'm just trying to say is that notwithstanding or maybe and consistent with all that. You know, I, I kind of look at what the Ukrainians would like for what they're trying to do. And the sense I get from them is they want us to help. And that is something that I have to live with every night is that they are asking for help. They're trying to become a member of the European Union. They're trying to become a member of NATO. They, you know, they're voting with their vision of what they want to be their future and it's not a Russian future. And kind of when I look at Putin and all that and his concerns, I said, you know, when the USSR fell apart in 1989, all those satellites could have said, hey, we want to hang out with Russia. But what did they do? They all went towards Europe. That was their choice, you know? And they suggested that something that was more sort of democratic than what they lived in those puppet regimes on, that, that, that the Soviets had in place. That was kind of a statement of not of voting with your feet, so to speak. And you might not like that as a Russian, you know, and I can understand that, but that's the reality of what, how the people see it, you know. You know what? You know what I'd like to say, and I think we can do. I think we can. 
stand for democracy and reevaluate democracy. I don't see why we can't do those two things simultaneously. Um, we talk about conflict creating opportunity. Um, I think this is an opportunity to, to ask when we say that we're standing for democracy, what are we standing for? How, how has that looked? How can it look? Can we make it better? I think we can do those things. I think that the next few weeks are going to be really interesting because um, are we going to be willing to pay higher gas prices? Are we going to be willing to suffer some of the economic consequences for these sanctions? Because we are going to feel some of those in ways we haven't before. Um, you know, I think when we look at Crimea, we look at Georgia, we have not been willing to do the kinds of things to, to penalize those aggressions. It seems like now finally we're starting to draw a line in the sand. Are we going to stay there? Are we going to as things get harder, as gas goes to five dollars a gallon, six dollars a gallon, um, are we going to be willing to to take those economic um, uh, uh, consequences? I hope we can. Um, but again, I think that as we keep saying we stand for democracy, we should also be asking, what exactly does that mean? How have we implemented it, and how can we improve it? So, in our last minute here give each of you a short shot. Hey, all experienced for decades in conflict resolution, its practice, its teaching, is there any way, any path toward resolution of this conflict that is constructive in your view? Uh, I'll just jump in first with the hooray to the diplomats. And I would just say, let's get a one hour ceasefire. <laughs> okay. And let's get a two hour ceasefire. Then let's get a five hour ceasefire. Then let's get a 12 hour ceasefire. You know, I mean, really, that's the levels. I saw that there's a, there are humanitarian corridors being set up, at least that's part of sort of dealing with uh, civilian uh, refugee situations, at least that kind of thing. But bit by bit, um, you know, the ceasefires is the getting a one that holds is always the first step, I think, for this kind of thing. I would agree with that. And I think the only way, the only thing, as long as there's fighting going on, you know, there's going to be, I, I have to say that I don't know, I don't believe people when they talk about their, democ their goals for democracy. I, Think that they're talking about their goals for them being in power in the way they want to be in power, and that when they and that ultimately they're going to have a flawed democracy. And uh, if we're going to support the Ukrainians, we should make sure not only should we look at what it is we mean by domestic democracy, but we also should understand what it is they mean. Uh, and wanting to join NATO, wanting to join the European Union, that doesn't mean anything to me. What are you going to do to the people who are the lowest in your country and how will they have access to political power? in your country? Or is it going to end up being the elites with the money controlling the democracy like it is here in the United States? You know, getting to Chuck's quest question about what can we do um, in the short term, I think we need some kind of face-saving resolution, if at all possible. Can we craft something that Putin would take as uh, not identifying him as a in the, the Trump kind of language as a loser. Um, is there some kind of package that we can create that uh, he can walk away saying that, you know, I wasn't defeated in Ukraine? Um, what that would look like, I'm not entirely sure. Does that mean that we have to somehow give up sovereignty over these insurgent republics in the East? I'm not sure. But I think that if, if there's going to be a negotiated settlement, it's got to have that element to it, that there's got to be some opportunity for Putin to say that I wasn't defeated here. Well, thank you all for the wonderful insights. It sounds like that's, there's consensus that only if an international alliance can become sufficiently motivating and persuasive to both Putin, Russia, and Ukraine, Zelensky, 
to come to the table for a ceasefire for an internationally brokered negotiation that maybe some kind of exploration and balancing of interests other than military conflict might become possible. Thank you all. Thank Folks, you. come back and Thank join you. us. I think that's a fantastic insight. It makes a lot of sense. And see you all again in two weeks, hopefully in a better place for everyone. Thank you. Peace Thank be you. with you.